and that's how I grew up with a, a family that gathered around uh, a round oak table and ate food and told stories and talked long into the night um, about everything, um, about funny things, about serious things. It was what we wanted to know. We wanted to know story, and story is what my work has been about. And I'm going to talk to you about that tonight. Um, the title of my book is Vittles, and Vittles is the absolute correct and always has been correct English pronunciation of the word that is spelled V-I-C-T-U-A-L-S, meaning we've been right all along. Ha ha. Take that, Granny Yoko. Um, so Vittles has a subtitle, and the subtitle is an Appalachian journey with recipes. And I wanna to talk to you a bit about my journey, and I'm not gonna give you recipes, um, um, uh, except to tell you, do not put sugar in your cornbread. I really don't have to say that to this group, right? We're all on the page? Okay, good. Um, but I'm not gonna give you recipes, but I am gonna give you ingredients. The ingredients, uh, certain ingredients that I found on my journey to produce this book that I think maybe you all can find useful as well. I was gonna say something about, you know, you're the cook, so you can take these ingredients. I was getting all tongue waggled in a really bad um, series of metaphors, and I got worried that James Still and Harriet Arno would rise up and bash me in the head. So, so I'm just gonna give you ingredients and you can do what you will. Um, this book, people ask me how, you know, when did you start writing this book? How did you write this book? How did you start this book? What made you want to write this book? And there's a bunch of different answers. John opened this restaurant in 2002 before we had terms like locavore or before we talked about, we might talk about organic food, but we didn't talk about sustainable farming at that time. It, it was a whole different era. And, but, but people were starting to be interested in that kind of food. And what John said was, was that his brother Robert went to Charleston and opened a restaurant there, the Hominy Grill, and Robert won lots of James Beard Awards. But what John said was that despite the Beard Awards and accepting seafood, he had landed in the catbird seat by landing in Appalachia because every other chef in the country of his age that he knew who was interested in this idea of, of representing the region that you were in or, or sourcing, everybody who was interested in sourcing locally at that time had to prime the pump. They had to go to farmers and say, would you grow this for me so I can use it in my restaurant? Would you grow this kind of heirloom tomato that I found on you know, this kinky uh, seed website uh, so I could have a tomato that tasted like a tomato? Would you, would you grow this plant for me? And John Stelling said all he had to do was get in his beat up old station wagon and drive 20 miles outside of Asheville and stop at a farm stand or stop at a farm itself when he would see a farmer out in the yard or somebody with a garden working their garden. He would stop and he'd start a conversation and he'd say, what, what's that you're growing there? What kind of a what, well, what kind of a squash is this? You know, it looks like a giant orange watermelon with ridges. And somebody would say, "Well, that's a candy roaster, son. Have you never had a candy roaster?" And and he would go home and, and cook it up and eat it, and it would be on on his menu. Or he would find something like clay peas. Um, I didn't. I had already written a book about. Appalachian food, and I'd written a book about southern beans uh, called Butter Beans to Blackberry, Southern Beans and Vegetables, and I had never heard of clay peas, and you know, I'm a mountain girl. I didn't know that we grew that many field peas, but lo and behold, there's this beautiful little red pea that we grow, it's field pea, that we grow up in the mountains, and it tastes like the mountains. It tastes like minerals. It has a, it has what my mother called a wang to it, which is uh, when I have to explain a wang, I say that's Appalachian umami, people. Um, anyway, uh, and it, it was a beautiful food, and, and he didn't have to ask someone to grow it for him. He found it being grown in the region, and he found not only greasy beans, but like 12 varieties of greasy beans, and, and they could be cooked in different ways, and you could taste them and make something special out of it, specific to that time and place. And, and he said, you know, people who come to the Appalachian Mountains, 
They want to know the place that they're in. They want to taste it. And that became his passion. But what John said to, that I thought was so interesting in talking further about this is that this gift that he had, this, this range of farmers and people who were growing uh, heirloom seeds that they had saved, foods that were distinct to the region, and who were growing them based on the, the quality of their land, the place where the sunlight hit. You know, you plant one of your beans here and you plant your tomatoes somewhere else because they need different kinds of sunlight. And you might have another bean back in another part because it grows better back there. It's, it was a consciousness of the land itself, an awareness and an understanding, and an understanding of the climate. Um, an understanding of the fact that we are a southern larder. Appalachian foods are based on the same principles as the rest of the South, but we are a southern larder with a winter, a bitter winter, a super cold winter, shortened growing seasons. So we develop foods that we can eat through the winter. You go deeper south, they continue growing those beans. They continue getting those melons and tomatoes, and the food continues on with just a very short gap there. We have a big gap. We've got a Cumberland gap up here, you know? It's like a cold time that, that you're not getting something out of the garden. So we create shuck beans, our leather bridges, our shucky beans, our fodder beans. But y'all know what I'm talking about. And, and we put up green beans and corn. We ferment them. And we make sour corn and pickled beans, or pickled corn and sour beans. We don't necessarily agree on what we call these things, but but we make all these foods. We make we dry apples so that we can have fried apple pies, and then we can also make this glorious thing called an apple stack cake. These foods I've just named to you, they don't show up anywhere else in in, in American culinary history, except in the Ozarks or in places where Appalachians settled. These, these are distinctly Appalachian foods. And we learn to do this because of the disadvantage of having shortened growing seasons and a, a deep winter. And we learn to save our seeds because of the disadvantage of being um, a sustainable economy instead of a purchasable economy. Um, and, and we learn to work with what we have, the land that we have, and the weather that we have, and the minerals and resources that we have, and the time that we have. And, and these are all things that we've been told are disadvantageous to us, right? We've been told to move away. We've been told if we want to, if we want to grow food, go out there in the Midwest when there's all that flat land. Well, guess what? Now out there in the Midwest, there's one corn. You know, uh, and it, it's not the magical one cornbread, one god corn. It's it's just a monoculture of corn, or a monoculture of soybeans, or a monoculture of wheat. And over here in Appalachia, we have kids right now that are finding corns and and rye and buckwheat and wheat flowers that that have these amazing names. You know, of bloody butcher and German rye and. Uh, Cherokee, this, that, and the other. We have, we have all of this amazing diversity that has been born out of adversity. So one of the first lessons that I had in writing this book was to adjust my thinking and to learn to think about the possibility that disadvantage was really a blessing and a gift. That if you can learn how to work with it and adapt to it, you can make something pretty extraordinary out of it. And that flies in the face of, of what we've been told to do in our culture. Become, become more like everyone else. Make things more like the rest of the world. Um, don't you want this mountain flattened out and made into flatland that you can plant a lot of vines on? Um, no, maybe not. Maybe we want that mountain to remain a mountain because we can grow up at things that people on, in the flatland are not growing. So that was one of the ingredients that I got. Change the way that you're thinking. 
right? Then a second piece of this journey happened in 2011. So I, I, I wrote the first book proposal. If there's anybody in here who's here to be encouraged to um, write a cookbook for fun and profit, um, you're in the wrong room. Um, <laughs> uh, I can tell you, you can write it for heart and soul. I'm way down with that. But I wrote the first proposal for this book in 2008, and I probably wrote 12 other proposals before it sold in 2014. In 2011, I rewrote the proposal to accommodate a study that was done by ethnobotanist Gary Nobbin, and botanical anthropologist, I think he is, Jim Vitetto. And these guys are, uh, Gary Nobbin is especially famous among seed savers and people who are very knowledgeable about American and Mesoamerican foodways. It's his life work. He and Jim is a young man who had been working in Western North Carolina, was doing his uh, postgraduate work with Gary Nobbin in Arizona. And Jim said, Gary, I think that um, Appalachia, Southern Appalachia, is this remarkable food shed. Why don't you let me go start documenting all the things that I know? And so he did. Uh, Jim came back and he documented the varieties of beans and apples and corn that he could find that we were growing and the varieties of wild foods that people still foraged and still ate from, not just the ramps that everybody's eating and not just that poke salad that you better pick at the right time or not eat, but all the different kinds of beautiful little plants that people knew either how to eat or cure themselves are used in some sort of uh, edible, medicinal way. And he talked to people about hunting practices and what they hunted and what they cooked and what animals were available. And you have to understand that, that we're starting here from the premise that, that Southern Appalachia is an incredibly biodiverse region. It is a temperate rainforest. So the things that we can grow, the things that grow naturally and live naturally here in the water, on the land, in the forest, they are so diverse already to begin with. But, but what was interesting and in what Jim was doing was he was also talking with the people of the region about how they had maintained that diversity when the rest of America and much of the world in the same time period was losing strains of corn, was losing strains of beans, was, was getting apples down to the five that you can buy in the store that, you know, are now you can buy 12 and they're all sons of delicious. But, um, but you know, Jim's going, why, why, why do you have a thousand, a thousand different documented varieties of apples in Appalachia? And people were telling him, they were telling him um, uh, about their grandfathers who grafted four apple trees, four apple branches on the same tree so that he could have an apple in every season of the year, right? Or, or how this seed was passed from one family to another and the story behind it, et cetera, et cetera. And so what Jim, Jim and Gary discovered that Southern Appalachia is the second largest food basket in, North, in, in the Western Hemisphere, and the largest one in North America. I think that's amazing. Think about that. Think about that in terms of the resources that we know that we have here. Think about that as a resource that if we understand how to support it and cultivate it and nurture it and continue it, how it could in turn support us in a sustainable circle. And that's part of what Jim found. What Jim found was it wasn't just that all this stuff was naturally here or that your great-grandfather did this and we could look it up in a book and replicate it. What he found was that the people of the region have been using their wisdom and their knowledge to keep this alive, to keep this amazing food chain alive. That was, that was not just the place itself, but that was an act of the people. And by listening to these people, we could begin to understand how to continue this and to do it. We didn't need to go look somewhere else. It was the wisdom of our place was right here. So that was the second ingredient that I got with this book. Now the third piece of my journey has to do with 
All lo, all those many years, I wandered in the desert of New York publishing, trying to convince them that this temperate rainforest was worthy of their attention. Um, and um, it, it, you know, I, it, it won't surprise you all to hear the usual stories that I heard. I, I mentioned last night that uh, toward the, I thought I had a great publisher. She she was talking about a real book with photography and you know really digging into it. And then she sent me a note and said, "Is it's okay with you if we drop Appalachia from the subtitle because of the association with poverty?" Uh, to which I said, "Bye. <laughs> you know? nice, nice talking to you." And and I had to say goodbye to other publishers from the region who understood the story and got it, but could not afford to send me out to do the research that I needed to do. Um, I, got, I got offers to write another version of, a, a version of a food memoir. Write about your family, write about their Appalachian experience, and tell the world that that is Appalachia. And now you got to understand that, that I, I was born in Corbin, I grew up in Louisville, but as many of you know, we went up home all the time. We went up home on weekends, we went up home for vacations, we had three or four family reunions every summer. Um, it, it was a part of my experience, but, but my family trees go back four to seven generations in the Appalachian Mountains. So I, I get to say that I am Appalachian. I get to speak. But there's no way that one person's story could possibly begin to, to encompass the incredible diversity of Appalachia. And this is something that was very hard for me to explain um, because people have been told that we are a monoculture and people are t have been told that we have been isolated, that we, you know, we don't have immigrant communities. And what I had to talk about, what I wanted to talk about in the food and the foodways, what I had to talk about was the African American uh, experience in Appalachia, uh, which begins with the salt the salt industry, which is the first extractive industry in Appalachia, which begins in the late 1700s. I had to talk about the industrial background of Appalachia, which begins in the 1700s. We're not this agrarian world. I needed to talk about why every cookbook that you pick up from a coal town in the southern Appalachians will have a recipe for Hungarian goulash or paprikash, chicken paprikash, or hunky stew in it. I had to explain pepperoni rolls. Um, I wanted to talk about when, I wanted to talk about and didn't have the opportunity um, in this book, maybe there will be a son of Vittles, um, but I wanted to talk about the Spanish chorizo that is made in West Virginia and how Astorians from Spain came into the region as late as the 1950s. I wanted to tell that story. I wanted to tell the story, if you open up Vittles and you look at in the first couple of pages, you'll see that there's a spread of Chattanooga you know, a cityscape of Chattanooga. That's there because I wanted my photographer to take that picture and I wanted it in the early part of the book because I want people to understand that there's such a thing as urban Appalachia as well. I wanted people to get this whole picture and my story doesn't come close to the whole picture. It gives me the right to ask the questions and it gives me a right to, I, I, right is the wrong word actually, I debate that. That's another, that's another meeting. But, but it gives me an entry into asking the questions and talking to the people and saying, your story is a part of mine. Can, can I tell it? Can I try to tell your words? And this comes back again to a piece of that first ingredient, which is that if we're going to create sustainable economies, um, and food can be a part of a sustainable economy, but it cannot be the entire answer. It has to be a piece of whatever a specific community needs it to be. If you're over in Asheville, it can be a piece of, of um, brew culture and hipster culture and uh, being in big food magazines. And if you're in Corbin, it needs to be a piece of 
creating something beautiful that people can be proud of in a restaurant, but affordable for the people in your community as well and welcoming to them as well. And, and you cannot just have a farm, a, a couple of kids or a seventh generation that wants to farm and you give them money to farm and you don't connect them with someone who can use their products and, and you don't create a system that can get the products back and forth to them. Again, it's, it's sustainable, like this whole concept of sustainable and it's difficult, just like our story of difficulty, but all those things make it really rich and give us tremendous, tremendous possibilities. And this is the other piece that I had learned from that journey. So these are the things that I felt like maybe I could leave with you all. Like I said, you're the leaders, uh, you're the cooks. Um, I wish that Pat and Jerry Lundy were here to um, find out that their daughter was actually talking to the leaders of Eastern Kentucky. They would just be um, a little shocked and extremely proud and then they would have a few things to tell you. And my father would say, stress what I just said about, listen to the people of the region. They have the wisdom. Every community has, it's just like every plot of garden. Every community has different light and different soil and a, a different weather pattern. And you know, you know if you take your mamma's uh, greasy beans and you plant him over in your holler, which is on the other side of the ridge, after about three years, your greasy beans and her greasy beans are gonna be different. They'll both be good, but they will be different because they're planted in different places. We have to learn to listen to the individual communities and the people in those communities. They have the wisdom. They understand how it's going to work and what will work for them. And we don't need any more for someone to come tell us what we ought to do. Um, I'll be 70 years old next year, and, I, and you know, I'm at that age where you start going, by golly, I've got a new motto. You know, but one of my new mottos was, it's either pajamas or it feels like pajamas or I don't wear it. That's, that's a good <laughs> motto. Right. Uh, 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 well, now I've, lost, <laughs> I've forgotten what the other motto was. <laughs> Oh my God, I think I might be 70 already. <laughs> but but what I, I'll text you all the motto when I think of it at 3 a.m. Um, what I want to say, what I, what I want to say, and you're hearing me say it, and I'm stressed it enough, is that is that we. Oh, my other motto is this: any sentence, any sentence that begins, you know what you should do, should not be finished. <laughs> All right, and we have heard over and over again, you know what you people should do, you know what you all should do. We even say it to each other. You know, I, I can stand over on the other side of the Blue Ridge and say, you know what you all should do up there? And I don't know squat, okay? I'm only looking at my little garden spot. So we need to start telling each other what it is we need and want and what we can do. And then those of us who can lead, those of us who get a microphone, need to start telling, telling that story for the people who don't have the microphone. And those of us who have the money to help need to start giving the money to the people who know what they can do to do with it instead of saying, I'm spending my money on you because I know better, all right? All right, that's enough preaching for now. One more thing, I, 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 so I told you that's what my dad would say, listen to the people, and my mother would say, and tell him again, don't put sugar in your cornbread, okay? I <laughs>